Your body, your mind will say something like, I don't want to study. I don't like to read. I, I don't want to assemble with those folks. I've got a better idea, God, than your idea. Thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. And I trust as always that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several moments. Our intentions tonight as always is to help disciples learn how to make disciples. I trust that you are a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ and that you've purposed to help make disciples of others. We're going to continue on with a series tonight that we began last week or some time ago. It's actually the continuation of a teaching through the book of Ephesians. This particular part found in chapter 6 is titled Standing or Standing and it deals with the issue of coming against the enemy of our soul, Satan. God has purpose and plan for the resources for you to be able to overcome the enemy. God has a purpose and a plan that when deployed by you will enable you to stand against the devil's schemes. Are you aware of that? Is that even on your radar? I trust that it is, and I trust that you will be encouraged to stand on the Word of God and to allow this to flow to and through you in the days to come. Let me uh, read for you just one verse of Scripture tonight. Our text passage again is Ephesians chapter 6, but I want to read an additional verse it's going to, that we're going to get to here very, very short. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, one of my favorites. And it puts it this way. This is verse 9 of Philippians chapter 4. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. You know, I hear a lot of po folks talk about God and a relationship with God and they believe in God and in the peace of God and, and how to acquire that. And this tells us right here how that is achieved. And we're going to get into it very shortly. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for every person that's turned on this telecast. And I pray that by your word, through the Spirit, that you would speak to our hearts. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, you hang on. I'm going to be back here in just a little while to wrap things up. God bless. Satan intends to distract you. Now, fill in number four. The gist of this distraction is by influencing your disobedience. I want to tell you again, if you're born again, spirit-filled, the devil cannot make you do anything. Well, that ain't what preacher so-and-so told me. Well, I hope he'll study the Word of God and come back and apologize to you because born again, spirit-filled people uh, have, have within them greater than that which is in the world devil can't make you do anything. But the gist of his distraction or efforts to distract is to influence your disobedience. That's what's being referenced here in Ephesians chapter 6 when it, it talks about the day of evil that's going to come. In verse 11, it talks about the, the schemes of the devil. We dealt with that last time. That's, that's what he's referencing in verse 13, the day of evil. The day of evil is any day, watch this, in which evil reigns as a consequence of our disobedience. The church, listen to me. I'm here to build you up, not beat you up, but I want you to catch this. It is way easier to blame Satan for something than it is to take responsibility for our own disobedience. Here's some good news. You're like, Phew, I thought you'd never get there. Here's some good news. Satan cannot harm you, distract you, influence you, if. 
Somebody say, if what? If you know what I'm about to tell you. Now, we'll deal with that in part two. Would you stand? We're going to be dismissed. No, I'll get to you right now. <laughs> Did you know that the primary battleground for all things spiritual is not out here? Everybody do this. <laughs> but rather, it's between your ears. Do this. Some of you are already doing that. No, 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 no. The primary battleground for all things spiritual is not out here, but rather between your ears. Back in 1995, the best I can deduce, author and speaker Joyce Myers introduced the book titled Battleground of the Mind. The first chapter is titled The Mind is the Battlefield. Listen carefully. The battle, beloved, is between our thoughts Thoughts which are influenced by our own cravings, our own flesh, our own sight. It's no wonder that James said this, and you can find it in chapter 4, verse 1 of, of his book. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from, look at this, your desires that battle within you? See, James knew about this. Paul was writing to the church in Philippi, and he got to chapter 4, verse 8, and here's what he said. Finally, brothers, he's getting down to the nitty-gritty. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, say it out loud with me, church, think about such things. Things. Let me ask you this. Where is the realm or the sphere of thoughts? Is it out here? Or is it in between here? It's the mind. It's the soulish realm. Joyce Myers was right. Fill in number five with me on your study notes. Beloved, putting on the armor and standing your ground is not a physical posture. It's not a physical posture. It's a spiritual determination. And I trust that you are at least beginning to get it, that yes, we live in this physical world, but there's a spiritual, there's things outside, but there's also some, so some very important things that take place on the inside. Standing your ground is not a physical thing. It's a spiritual determination. Actually, it's a decision. Can you say decision as you fill in the blank? D-E-C-I-S-I-O-N, period, decision. Listen to me, church, and it's not a once-for-all decision. You know, I spent many years of the formative years of my walking with the Lord thinking that I had went to an altar one night and, and I knelt down and I confessed my sins. I repented of my sins. I opened up my heart's door and I asked Jesus to come in. And I believed that He did something because He did do something. My life was changed. And I sort of thought I was going to get up and go on and be a Christian and everything was just going to be lovely after that moment. Well, guess what? Every day, you have to make a decision. Some days, every hour, you have to make a decision. Some hours, every minute, you have to make a decision about these things that I'm talking about. Standing your ground. It's not something you just do at the altar one time. And many people find that out. Do you have any earthly idea how many people have knelt at this very altar and got up and walked away and we've never seen them again? That's not what God had in mind. It's a contest, beloved, that's played out in the mind and the spirit. Let me show you. Are you up for this? Here we go. I was at uh, Martinsville High School one day this week. Kid come running up to me out of the blue. He said, Pastor Knight, I'm coming to your church. I said, that'd be great. He said, you're not boring. <laughs> And I looked him right in the eyes and I said, let me tell you something, uh, young man. If you can make church boring, there, you need therapy. There's something wrong with you. 
I'm just saying. But let me, let me help you with this. <laughs> Let's say that God says something to you through His Word. Has He ever said anything to you through His Word? Say yes. It's here. You know why some people don't read this? Because they don't want to hear what God has to say. You tell me it's because you don't like to read. It's not because you don't like You read all the time. How many of you have, uh, well, where did mine go? How many of you have one of these? Hold on. How many of you have one of these? You don't like to read? You better throw this away. You know, my daddy calls this a telephone. That's not a telephone. A telephone is this little thing. You do it and it rings on the other end and you talk on it. Somebody tell me what percentage of the time you talk on these as compared to the amount of time you read on these. Just something for you to think about. I don't know. Where in the world did that come from? I wish you'd quit distracting me, Patrick. Let me get back to, let me get back to, to where we were. I was asking the question. God says to you through His Word, do this. Do something. When that happens, let me show you what happens when that happens. Let me give you an example. I'm going to two passages. 2 Timothy 2.15 and also Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. If, if you have your Bible, find those two spots. They're, they're not hard to find. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Are you studying the word of God? I don't like to read. You know, part of me wants to say, shut up. I'm glad I didn't say that. But lover, you need to read and study the Word of God so that you will know how to correctly handle it. There's a command there, by the way. If you go over to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, it says this, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. Are you in the habit of doing that? Would you stand up if you are? No, I'm kidding. Now, some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Do you know when you read passages like that, study to show yourself approved, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together and encouraging folks. When you read that, your flesh, and I'm talking about your biological drives, your eyes that you see the world with and your mind that you do a lot of thinking with, those things will come forth or, or come against those commands kicking and screaming. They will. Your body, your mind will say something like, I don't want to study. I don't like to read. I, I don't want to assemble with those folks. I've got a better idea, God, than your idea. I'm going to do what the devil did. I'm going to kick you off your throne. I've got a better idea. I don't, I don't want to assemble. I don't want to encourage people. Watch this. I love to be encouraged, but I don't want to encourage anybody. You ever thought about how selfish that is? You know, those, I call them spiritual sponges. They want to suck the life out of you, but they never want to say, How you doing? Good to see you. How's your mom and him? I'm praying for you. Love you. Mean it. Give me a hug. It's always... <laughs> Don't you love to see people like that coming? Oh, here comes the sponge. I better put away whatever I have. Where in the world did that come from? Seems like I'm doing a lot of extra preaching. Y'all are going to have to pay me overtime this week. Listen, when that happens, beloved, your spirit, will you say my spirit? Did you know you had a spirit? You've got a body, a mind, the soulless realm, and a spirit. And when you're born again, that spirit is put back in the, the image and likeness of God like it was in Adam before Adam messed up. Your spirit, when you are born again, is infused with Holy Spirit power. Amen. It is. And as such has been enabled and equipped to bring those contestants that we just talked about into subjection. When my mind 
Or my eyes say, hey, I don't want to do this. I don't want to read that. I don't want to look at this. Or my mind gets all jacked up. And uh, your spirit takes control, uh, infused by Holy Spirit. And it comes out sounding something like this. Yes, you are going to study. You're going to study whether you want to or not. Yes, you are going to worship whether you want to worship or not. How many of you get tired of standing up on Sunday morning? I hear that a lot here. Y'all stand up too much. Think I'll go off to race next Sunday. Sit down a little bit. Good luck with that. Buddy, you are going to stand up and worship the Lord. I don't like lifting my hands. Listen, I'm not here for what you like. I'm here to try to help you understand the Word of God. And we're told to to lift high. We're told to clap. We're told to sing loud in our worship. And if you don't like that, you're probably going to be that bunch in heaven that's standing over in the corner wondering, what in the world's going on up here? I wish he'd go on another vacation. Listen to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. You know, the natural man and the natural mind doesn't live this way, but the born-again, Spirit-filled aren't natural. They are indeed supernatural. They're above nature. Fill in number 6 when we're getting close to the end here. Beloved, we've been issued some supernatural equipment by which we may engage those things that threaten our obedience. Have I got time to wrap this up? Say yes. Well, I was going to close, but since you said yes. (laughs) This will be relatively brief as an intro to Saturday night's message. I want you to catch this. How many of you know that the Bible uses physical objects to teach us about spiritual issues. Beloved, most of the spiritual battles that you face will not ultimately come in the form of physical attacks. In fact, and we embellished this quite a bit a couple of weeks ago, verse 12 of Ephesians 6 says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against the physical. I didn't make that up. That's what the Word of God says. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So, Pastor Terry, how does Satan attack us? What is the nature of these attacks? He does it by influencing our thoughts. How does he do that? By the way, Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He is not omnipotent. He is not all-powerful. He is not omnipresent. He is not all places at all times. He's not that. So how does he do this? How does he influence our thoughts? He does that by, for a lack of a better term, parading distractions before us. How does that work? Go with me to Matthew 4 and Luke 4 and Mark 1, all at the same time. There's a classic illustration to help you understand what I just said. And you Bible scholars will realize that that is what we refer to as the temptation of Christ. Jesus Christ had some interaction with Satan. Now, the interaction between Jesus and Satan was on a totally, totally different plane, but the components, will you say components? The components were the same. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 tells us why it had to be that way. And I need to read this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Say it with me, church. Yet was without sin. You'll remember that story. Jesus hadn't had anything to eat for 40 days. When I haven't had anything to eat for 40 minutes, I'm ready to eat the hind end out of a hobby horse. Say amen right there. I'm just saying. (laughs) Jesus was hungry. I ain't believing he said that. He was hungry. 
So Satan tempted him to turn a rock into a loaf of bread. Isn't that about the dumbest thing you ever did here? So he was tempting Jesus physically. And then Satan attempted to convince Jesus that he could give him authority and power. In many respects, the one that created that messenger is offering to give the Creator power and authority. Thus, he was tempting Jesus spiritually. Satan attempted to convince Jesus to do something that could have been injurious to the human part of him, thus tempting him psychologically. Fill in number seven, our last note, and we're going to wind this up. I want to suggest to you that Satan and his minions all the little demons are still attempting to influence us in these areas even today. And I'm talking about right now. He's uh, attempting to influence us physically and spiritually and psychologically. One writer puts it a bit more poetically. He says, Satan's temptations were hedonism, egoism, and materialism. If you go over to John chapter 2, which we quoted a week or so ago, John the evangelist in this little epistle categorized these temptations as the, the lust of the eyes, materialism, the lust of the body, hedonism, and pride of life, egoism. Hey, listen. God has provided us, the born again, Spirit-filled, a means of overcoming the enemy. Not yielding to him and then blaming it on him and in so doing, promoting what he's doing. But God has given us power to overcome. And it's the armor that we're going to be talking about Saturday night, the Lord willing. Let me ask you this. Did you know that God has a plan and resources that will allow you to stand against Satan? Did you know that? I trust you know it now. Can I ask you, is that even on your radar? I'm, I am frustrated so often nowadays by all the things that the church dabbles in and talks about instead of talking about these things that really matter. Is this on your radar are you discerning about what comes before your eyes? Men, listen to me. Boy, isn't this a neat little gadget right here? You can look at stuff on here that you ain't got no business looking at. Somebody say amen. You can get involved in they put stuff before your eyes on here that your eyes don't have any business seeing. Like that. Good gracious, you should see this. <laughs> it's just my screen. Somebody just texted me. My wife's got a screw loose. Say amen right there. <laughs> it was that little heart thing. Emoticon thing. So, uh... We're going to the house. We'll see y'all later. <laughs> Are you discerning about what comes before your eyes? I might as well close because you've checked out, I'm sure. <laughs> Listen to me. I was reminded once again this week. You heard me say this. I haven't said this in a long time. This probably needs to be said more often. There's only one place that I know of where there's not going to be any laughter. And I've made arrangements not to go there. That's hell. Preacher, you believe in hell? Well, I have to. The Bible talks about it. I'm not one of them that takes pages out. So laughter is a good thing. Are you careful about what comes before your eyes? They are the window to the soul. And that's, that's one of the problems that we have in the church today. But God has given us something to help us to overcome that. There's a song... And Zach, you might have to help me. That I think the title of it is Holy Spirit, but I know a different Holy Spirit. Where'd Zach go? There you are. He moved. I hate it when y'all move. Get over here in your seat. What the world? <laughs> uh, it's called Holy Spirit, and there's a line in it that says something like, Let us become more aware of your presence. Whew, what a thought. Let us become more aware of your presence. 
pray with me. Beloved, we're going to wrap it up tonight this way. Listen, Satan is continuing, and Satan's helpers continuing to attempt to move in on the lives of people even in this day. And that, that's nothing new. Most people know that. Most people, even though they wrestle with that, they know that there's a formidable enemy out there coming against their soul. Here's what's left unsaid so often. Those who are in Christ have a power within them, a power available to them to overcome the works of the evil one. The Bible says, Greater is he that is in us, Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. The devil and his spirit helpers, if you please. I want to be an encouragement to you to dig in, to understand the Word of God, and to know uh, what's available to you in terms of the power from God to be an overcomer. Stop yielding to the devil. We hear so often today, I hear testimonies coming from good many, well-meaning people that the devil made them do this or the devil's been on me this week and I've succumbed to this and succumbed to that. Listen, put him in his place. The Bible says this, resist the devil, resist, come against him, resist him and he will flee. It doesn't say there that we have to uh, you know, just kind of mess around the muck and the mire and, and take whatever he throws at us, just the opposite. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That means something. And I want to be an encouragement to you to prayerfully come against the enemy. Take your stand. That's what this whole series is about. Standing, just standing there, or really standing, standing against the enemy of our soul. God has given you victory through Jesus Christ by the power of of the Spirit. Father, I pray for every person that's turned on this telecast tonight and is hearing this, and I pray in particular for those who have been assaulted, just a frontal assault by the enemy this week or these past few days, these past few hours, even now. God, help them to stand upon your word, your truth, and learn how to uh, implement that which you have granted to us, that which you've placed within us in the power of the Spirit, so that they might be victorious over the enemy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, listen, I'm probably speaking to someone tonight. You've just dug yourself in a hole uh, over time. Uh, you've just gotten yourself in all kinds of trouble spiritually. And listen, you're not going to get out of that just like that. That's not going to come around really quickly. But step by step, inch by inch, you can gain victory over the enemy through the power of the Spirit, through God's power. Be encouraged to understand that and to begin to uh, implement that in your own life or to call upon God to help you in your own life. I am Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church. I trust you're going to have a great week. And remember, my friends, Jesus is coming back. Is He coming back for you?